Uh, tonight's debate will be structured around four questions that we provided to Professor Zamar and Gelzo in advance. They'll each have about uh, roughly five minutes per question, and once we've gone through the four questions, we'll open things up uh, for Q&A from the audience. And uh, there will be a microphone set up down here to my right, your left, um, on a stand that you'll be able to get it up and then everybody can hear your, your questions. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, just uh, give the, uh, the first question, and then I'll turn things over to Professor Amar. The first question is, why was the Electoral College included in our constitutional design? It's such an honor to be with you all. Thank you so much for inviting me, and, 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 and thank you to my distinguished friend and colleague um, uh, for um, uh, being here with me. Uh, there's, in history, an, um, almost never just one cause of, of anything, um, but the Electoral College was much more about slavery than is conventionally understood. Let me first tell you what it wasn't really about. It's not a college. Uh, Princeton's a college. Um, Yale's a college, uh, Villanova has a college within a university. The word college isn't used in the document. And it, so some of you are taught, oh, they didn't believe in democracy, republics are different than democracy. Republics are the same as democracy. One is Greek, one is Latin. The party, uh, Jefferson's party, alternatingly calls itself the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, potato, potato. And if democracy is a bad word, why is the dominant political party in America call itself the Democratic Party, which is Andy Jackson's party? And, they put the con and, the, and the framers are proud Democrats. It says we the people, and they put the Constitution to a vote, and more people were allowed to vote than on anything before in human history, and they believe in direct election of a House of Representatives. You see what you didn't get under the Articles of Confederation, and many of them favored direct election of governors. So they're not doing an electoral college because they don't actually believe that ordinary people can make sensible decisions, and they need smart people in a college to substitute their judgment. And from day one, the college never substitutes its judgment. Uh, the the so-called electoral college, they're potted plants, they're nobodies from nowhere who never did nothing, and I can prove that to you in 15 seconds, because if I give you a few seconds, you can name a president or a vice president or a senator or a representative or a governor in American history, and you can't actually name any important elector who is famous for being an elector in all of American history, and from the beginning, they don't exercise independent judgment, they just do as told from day one, and uh, with very, very few exceptions. So we don't have the electoral college um, um, as some sort of filter. And in fact, the smartest political folks in the state aren't even allowed to be electors, senators and representatives. That's not why we have it. Um, oh, and you're taught is a balance between big and small states. Oh, not so much, because if it were, the framers were really stupid and they weren't stupid. Um, all, your, all your early presidents are big state people. Um, uh, Virginia's the biggest state and it wins eight of the first nine presidential elections. Um, we have two terms of Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. The other person is uh, uh, John Adams. He's from the second or third biggest state, depending on how you count. And then John Quincy Adams. We've had three small state presidents from all of American history, for all of American history, Bill Clinton, Zachary Taylor, Franklin Pierce. So if it's a big state bout, a small state bounce, oh, they didn't know what they were doing. Um, and the runners up were all big state people too. So actually, the conventional stories, smart college people substituting their intelligent judgment for the unwashed masses or balance between big and small states, these actually aren't very explanatory. Um, uh, there's a guy at Philadelphia. You've heard of Philadelphia. Um, they, uh, and his name's James Wilson. And he's one of six people who signed the Declaration of Independence in the Constitution. And he writes the words, we the people. And by acclamation, he's the greatest lawyer in America. And he says, following another guy from Massachusetts named Governor Morris, who are maybe the two best lawyers in America at the time, we should actually put the thing to a popular vote, um, just like we do actually in many states for governors. Um, and James Madison says, you know, that's a good idea. Here's the problem. The South will lose every time. I've done the math. He's the Carl Rove. Um, he says, in principle, you're right, but the South will lose every time, you see, because we don't let our slaves vote. And slaves are a huge part of the population. Um, and now, and Madison says at the time, suppose if you had something, and he, you know, he says that then, and, and, and another point, kind of like the Electoral College, oh, then we could count slaves, albeit at a discount, three-fifths, because the number of seats that a state gets in the Electoral College is based on its free population and its slave <laughs> population, you see, um, which is why eight of the first nine presidents are from Virginia. You see, it's going to favor a big state with a lot of slaves. Pennsylvania has more free people in 1800 
It has way more voters in 1800 and way fewer electoral votes in 1800. So the Pennsylvanians like direct election, the Virginians and the Southerners not so much because it allows them to count slaves. Now, not everyone understood this founding, and Hugh Williams says this is the same thing, and you shouldn't expect 10 people to say this in Philadelphia because they're embarrassed by this. Once Madison has let the cat out of the bag, actually everyone in the South knows that this is a deal breaker. Um, um, and. Uh, um, but the biggest uh, point um, is that um, we have these elections, and elections aren't between big and small states um, pr uh, candidates. They're between northerners and southerners. Um, and John Adams runs against Thomas Jefferson twice, and Adams wins the north twice. He's a northerner, and Jefferson wins the south twice. He's a southerner, and it's decided in the middle of the country. Um, and everyone understands in that second election. See, America isn't breaking, dividing, big state versus small state. It's dividing north against south. Um, and uh, the Constitution needs to be amended after uh, the second election because we need to separate vote for president and vice president. Um, and people say at the time, as long as we're doing that, let's fix the slave bias. You see, because every northerner understands that without the extra electoral votes created by slavery, Adams wins that second election. You know, he would win it by eight rather than losing it by four because 12 extra votes are generated in the South because of three-fifths. And a bunch of senators and Congress people, when the 12th Amendment is proposed, is proposed, you live in a 12th Amendment world. It's not the founders' electoral college you have. You have an electoral college where you vote separately for president and vice president. That's the 12th Amendment. And that's Jefferson's amendment. His party gets it through. The New Englanders don't like it. They say, if we're going to fix this thing between president and vice president, and have you vote separately, let's fix the pro-slavery bias. And it's obvious to everyone in America, and they don't fix it, which is why, basically, until Lincoln, and here I'll end, every president is basically um, a southerner, typically a southern slave home, owning plantation owner, or a northern man of southern sympathies, who plays footsie with the South, every single one. Um, and you say, oh, that's not true. Oh, uh, John Quincy Adams, he's old man eloquent against slavery. I saw that movie, Amistad. No, he's Vice President John C. Calhoun. And his father's vice presidential running mates are two Pinckneys from South Carolina, because you have to play footsie with the South, given the three-fifths clause. Until Lincoln, there's not a single president who says slavery is wrong and we should get rid of it. There's not a single cabinet officer in all of American history as a cabinet officer who says slavery is wrong and we should eventually get rid of it, because there's a pro-slavery bias in the Electoral College. That doesn't mean that we should get rid of it today. That just means we should acknowledge that at the founding, it has peculiar and complex roots. The question is, why was the Electoral College included in our constitutional design? One thing to start off with, even before we try to address the question or questions packed in there, is to look at this as it was in 1787. Not as it was in 1800, not as it was in 1860, not as it was in 1900, or beyond that. What did the founders think they were doing in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787 when they write a constitution that provides for the election of a president through electors? They don't actually use the word college, but that is the idea, a group of people who are coming together. The idea of a college actually owes a good deal to the model of the election of a king in Poland, of all places. Well, that was a potent example for the 18th century. Electors, that's the way we elect presidents. Sometimes we raise this question in terms of, well, why don't we just have a popular vote? But one of the problems, of course, is that the Constitution in 1787 didn't make any provision for a popular vote. There is no provision in the Constitution for a popular vote. We elect a president, constitutionally anyway, by the electors, by the Electoral College. And so much attention went to that subject that in fact, of the 4,000 words that make up the Constitution, 4,000 more or less, uh, almost 10% of that is devoted to the description of this Electoral College and the electors who elect a president. What we needed when we were designing the Constitution in 1787 was a means for electing a national executive. How do we go about doing it? Well, there was some question as to whether there should be a national executive in the first place. 
That was pretty hotly debated in the Constitutional Convention. But once it was agreed that there should be a national executive, then the question becomes, how is this executive to be elected? Should it be done by a national popular vote? That was one of the first proposals that was put on the floor by no one less than Pennsylvania's James Wilson. On the other hand, that had problems in the eyes of many of the members of the convention. Now again, we look at that and we say, well, we conduct everything by popular elections today. Well, that's today. That's not 1787. What did they see on the ground in 1787 that would influence their decision? Well, for them, the great fear was that a national popular election would first of all suffer from the problem that each of the 13 states had different rules on voter eligibility. Who was eligible to vote? Some states had property requirements. Some states had other kinds of requirements, residency requirements. They varied all over the place. There was no uniformity about how you <laughs> defined a voter. So if you're going to have a national popular vote, how do you do it when the rules for identifying voters vary so much from place to place in the United States? But a more potent objection that is raised in the convention is that a national popular vote might lead to the production of a Julius Caesar type president. Now we look back and we say, well, of course we didn't produce any Julius Caesars, but they did not know that in 1787. They had, in terms of the examples of republics, only the example of the small Florentine style city republics of the Renaissance and the Roman Republic. And of course, the Roman Republic was what yielded to Julius Caesar. So there was this very definite feeling, a national popular vote, that could give whoever we elected president the idea that they somehow spoke for the people and therefore could override the national legislature, the Congress. So there's a fear that way. Well, the alternative, alternative suggestion, going 180 degrees the other way, is to elect the national executive by Congress. Let Congress elect the president. But the objection that arises there is that that's going to make the president entirely too dependent on the Congress. The president will become simply a creature of the will of Congress. And if we're, what we're trying to do in this new constitutional arrangement is to create branches that will balance off against each other, an executive, a legislative, and a judicial branch. If, if we're going to try to create a separation of powers and a balance of power, you don't want to make the president, the executive, purely an invention of Congress, because then the president would simply become a puppet, and the executive branch would simply become a puppet of the legislative branch. And you can have legislative tyranny just as easily as you can have executive tyranny. So that was a concern. Do we go that way? Probably not. Actually, the method for electing a president isn't really settled until very, very late in the Constitutional Convention, when the Committee on Postponed Parts, there's an eloquent name for a committee. How would you like to be a member of a Committee on Postponed Parts? It's not until the Committee on Postponed Parts finally comes up with this formula that we have the idea that what we're going to do is elect the president in a two-stage fashion. The states, people in the states will cast their votes. And then, based on the results of these state, uh, the state voting, then the states, through their electors, will come together and elect the president. It was a way of slowing the process down and a lot of the times today, we complain about how much gridlock and how much slowness there is in government. They weren't really worried about that in 1787. If anything, they were worried about things that ran too fast. Because in Philadelphia in 1787, they had an excellent example right on their doorsteps of what happened when you had a popularly elected government. And that was the government of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It had a single cabinet legislature, it had an executive council, which was popularly elected, and it was a walking disaster. The 
state government of Pennsylvania passed all kinds of restrictive re religious legislation. It passed all kinds of onerous economic legislation. And it did exactly the kinds of things that people most feared from a direct popular election. Now, this is all around these delegates as they're meeting in Philadelphia. So the example is that they have in front of them suggests that it's much better to slow down. It's much better to break this process of election down into stages. Because then there's less likelihood of making the kinds of mistakes that had been made in the examples that were available to them. Now the question that most frequently bedevils us today is this question about whether the Electoral College was designed, in fact, to be a protector for slavery. Well, that is not nearly so clear as we might like it to be. Uh, first of all, we have to assume, if we're going to talk about slavery in the convention, we have to assume that if slavery is going to be favored somehow through the three-fifths clause in the Electoral College, we have to assume that there are some people who are going to be favored by it and some people who weren't. <coughs> Normally, what we think of as southern states, slave states, we think, well, you know, they're going to benefit from this. The problem with that is that in the convention in 1787, they were all slave states, except for Massachusetts, which had only, by judicial decision, uh, moved to eliminate slavery in 1780. So if there was a benefit to slavery, in the Electoral College using the three-fifths clause as part of the formula for representation and calculation of electors, um, it was a benefit that was going to go to all of the states, not just to quote-unquote southern slave states. Because there were no southern slave states, they were all slave states. Pennsylvania was a slave state. New York was the second most populous slave state in the Union. That's in 1787. Now, we know in the decades to come that's going to change, that the northern states are, one by one, going to take steps to either abolish or reduce slavery. But in 1787, they didn't know that. In 1787, to the contrary, the members of the convention, except for a handful of diehards from South Carolina who couldn't be persuaded otherwise, uh, they are, to the contrary, talking in terms of how they fully expect that slavery is going very shortly to vanish from the American scene. So you have Roger Sherman of Connecticut, you have Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut. They give very determined speeches on the subject of, we understand that slavery is a dying institution. We understand it's inconsistent with the values of the American Republic. But look, it's, it's going away. It's not going to last. And we are looking forward, as Ellsworth says, uh, to a time to come very shortly when no one will remember that there was any slavery in the American so is there favoritism to slavery in the Electoral College? Over time, yes, it does tilt that way. But in 1787, when they designed the Constitution, that isn't even on the screen, because they can't imagine how that is going to happen. And again, we have to see this through the eyes of the people who design the Constitution. I might add one other thing here. In terms of the Electoral College and slavery, the Electoral College did give some decided benefits to some Southern candidates for the presidency. On the other hand, in 1860, it was the Electoral College that gave us Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was elected president with only 39% of the popular vote, but he won a whopping majority in the Electoral College. We all know, if we know anything about Abraham Lincoln, what happens to slavery because of him. So in that respect, the Electoral College actually becomes the mechanism not for perpetuating slavery, but for getting rid of it in the history of the American Republic. Now again, nobody in Philadelphia in 1787 had a crystal ball or could see that. We have to take people as they were in 1787. But take it long term, not just the long term of 1836 or 1840, but of 1860. The Electoral College is what gives us Abraham Lincoln. And being a Lincoln person myself, maybe I'm a little prejudiced, but I think that's not a bad deal. All right, thank you. Uh, so I think I'll uh, go back to Professor Amar uh, at this point with our, our second question, which actually uh, dovetails with that quite nicely. 
Uh, the second question is, has the Electoral College played a positive or negative role in the history of American politics? Yes. Um, and both. And um, I was actually looking uh, for a quote um, from a recent book when, when I said, here's one thing to say in favor of the Electoral College. It gave us Abraham Lincoln. So we have that uh, point in common. Uh, and uh, I, I think I agree with, in the main with one other point, uh, but I disagree with most of what was said. Here's the other point. Um, it is true, and it is true today, and I'm anticipating some of the questions uh, that we're going to talk about um, about the Electoral College today, that there are real complexities if you try to tally up votes across different states. And we actually have never done that. We've t only tallied up votes within each state. And that was going to be an issue back then. It's an issue today. So that one I agree with. Um, the other points, not so much. If you think, and here's why. Because if you buy any of the other points, then you think states are stupid and states aren't stupid. We don't pick governors by anything like an electoral college today. In every single state, we pick them, basically, you can call it Caesarist if you like, one person, one vote, statewide, that's how we do it in Pennsylvania, call us crazy. Um, um, but we add up all the votes, and if it's close, we recount them carefully, um, except in Florida. Um, and, uh, um, and whoever has more votes wins. That call us crazy. That's how we do it in Pennsylvania. That's how we roll in Texas. That's how we do it in Connecticut. And each of these governors, you see, is quite like a president. In 48 of the states, they have four-year terms. Um, and they have a veto pen in every state and a pardon pen. They look a lot like presidents, and we don't pick them in this electoral college way. And at the time of the founding, you see, five states were already doing that. Um, so I don't buy this thing about Caesar. Um, and since the Pennsylvania Constitution was mentioned at the time in 1787, they've got, they're the only state that doesn't really even have a single uh, executive. They have a council. They're weird. And they're the only state along with Georgia that doesn't have a bicameral legislature. You all are weird. Um, but they get rid of all of that immediately by James Wilson, the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1790, which looks a lot like the US Constitution, a bicameral legislature, a one-person executive elected statewide, one person, one vote, you see. And all the other states move in that direction. Um, they don't move. We don't have little electoral colleges in California and Texas um, and the like for governors. So the Caesarism <laughs> argument is not a good one. Um, they, um, uh, they, five of the states, to repeat, had direct election at the time and all, of, of governors, and they're all moving in that direction, beginning with James Wilson in Pennsylvania in 1790. Now, you say all states have slaves. Well, let's look at the data. After this, um, I, I don't have my um, iPhone here. Look up, because you can do it for 15 seconds, the census of 1790. And you will see that not only does Massachusetts have no slaves, neither does um, New Hampshire, and Pennsylvania has 1%, and Virginia has 40%. And given it's about who has more votes than the other, of course, when you count slaves, there'll be the discount. You're favoring the states that have lots of slaves. Can you spell Virginia? It wins eight of the first nine presidential elections. Can you spell South Carolina, Pennsylvania? Look at the data of the census of 1790. It's 1% slaves. Because Pennsylvania, in 1780, has already taken steps for the gradual um, uh, abolition and emancipation of slaves. And other states are going to be moving in that direction. And that's not a story just about the 1830s and unforeseeable. It's already happened, not just about to happen, when the Electoral College is revised. Our Electoral College is not Philadelphia Article 2. It's the 12th Amendment, with a separate election of president, vice president. And it's been clear for everyone with eyes that America's dividing north against south, not big state against small state. And actually, in the last election, 12 extra votes for the south because of um, uh, the three-fifths um, um, uh, compromise. And in the next uh, presidential cycle, it's going to be 19 votes. Um, and they change other things. They adopt a constitutional amendment to fix things, but not that. Um, but the, I agree that the most positive thing that the Electoral College has done is give us Abraham Lincoln. It was not at all foreseen. As, um, it's, it's, um, but wow, that's good. Now, Abraham Lincoln only gets rid of slavery because the South is stupid enough to secede. 
um, and, and wage a war, an unjust war, um, against a duly elected person um, uh, and because they've basically been winning the game over and over and over again. Every antebellum president is basically a southern slaveholder um, or a northern doe face, a northern man of southern sympathies who plays footsie um, with the South. Um, uh, and um, so it's, it's like in the 1950s uh, when the Soviet Union was dumb enough to walk away from the UN um, allowing uh, America to, to get a resolution for intervention in Korea or something. So even Lincoln on his own can't do so much. It's because Lincoln, and it's because it's getting worse and worse and worse. Slavery is because of three-fifths. It's a compound interest rate that every 10 years, because of reapportionment, is actually um, getting worse. And in some of the states, actually, um, uh, you, you're, you're seeing, because um, uh, in 1860, only one state doesn't let its people vote for a president. The others do, beginning really um, um, uh, overwhelmingly by the 1820s. And the state that doesn't, you guessed it, is South Carolina, and here's why. Because they don't even want to have one person, one vote within South Carolina um, for um, presidential electors. They want to give extra clout to the slave-holding regions within South Carolina, so there's, there's a double bias. Um, you're weighting the South more because of three-fifths, and within some southern states that allow legislatures to pick, even though we're moving generally toward direct election, it's the slave-holding parts of those southern states that are getting extra clout. Um, but I agree, if, if it were, if even just the fact that it gave us Lincoln, wow, that's a big positive. Um, even though not remotely intended, do not give James Madison any credit whatsoever for that. He dies a slaveholder, he does not free his slaves. Um, I know them fighting words, uh, you know, not too far from here uh, in Princeton, but do not give him credit for this. I believe I'm speak first to the second question. Has the Electoral College played a positive or a negative role in the history of American politics. We might as well ask whether elections at all play a positive or, or a negative role in American politics. Uh, but the question that we have to ask here is, can we take this on the whole and look at it? I mean, there are going to be positives and negatives about elections of any description. Uh, how do we balance the situation? How do we understand the Electoral College? I think the fundamental question that we deal with when we're talking about the Electoral College and its role in American politics is legitimacy. Because one of the most difficult things to establish in a democracy, and the larger the scale of the democracy, the more pressing this question becomes, is this question of legitimacy. Is a person who is elected legitimate? In other words, do, does everybody acquiesce or almost everybody, enough people acquiesce in the election of a person because they see that the process by which the person was elected is legitimate. When lots of people don't like an election, um, what keeps them from breaking up the government? What keeps them from taking their bat and ball and going someplace else and playing by some different rules? Uh, actually, the only thing that does that is legitimacy. Does the Electoral College confer legitimacy? I think that's one of its more interesting accomplishments. Because generally what the Electoral College does is to confirm a great deal of popular voting. 17 out of 29 elections have been won by 200 or more electoral votes. Now that might engender in your mind the point, well, if that's the case, if the Electoral College is just a rubber stamp, why do we go through with it at all? It's because of when the popular vote is close. So close that people can be violently divided over the result. That's when the Electoral College lends an extra element of legitimacy to the result. As a kind of second stage election to assure people that really this process is reliable. So legitimacy is one, one thing which the Electoral College helps to convey. Again, it's not 100%, it's not perfect, but it still does better than incessant quarrels <laughs> that might result from very close elections. We have had, we have had
had in recent times some very close elections, both on the national and on the state level. Look at the results we have had. Is that what we want to see replicated over and over again, and especially over and over again on the national level? The Electoral College helps to defuse that. Another benefit which the Electoral College bestows is the discouragement that it gives to third parties. Now, again, some people might say, wait, 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 wait a minute, aren't third parties a good idea? Uh, how about fourth parties, fifth parties, sixth parties? The Electoral College, because it is, after all, a winner-take-all system, says that when the votes get tallied up, the one with the largest number of votes wins. It's not proportional. The result is not divided up. It's one, one individual is going to win. And what that says to the potential for third parties is, don't bother. Don't throw your votes away on small parties that don't really have a chance in a national election. Rather, concentrate on the prevailing two-party system. Now, some people might say, oh, well, I don't like either of those parties. Well, that's, that's your benefit and that's your right. But having a two-party system, rather than a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth party kind of system, does have at least this benefit, it forces moderation on the parties. If you have only two parties, if you have a winner-take-all system, which the Electoral College is, it forces the dominant parties to broaden their appeal as much as they possibly can. So it creates parties within the parties, you might say, moderate factions, radical factions, conservative factions, but still, it forces them all to adhere to some basic political tenets. And in that respect, in eliminating the need for third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth parties, what we do is we help to create a system of balance and moderation in the dominant parties. Because no party can afford to become a Johnny one note. Otherwise, it loses. It has to broaden. It has to be national. It has to have an appeal. If it doesn't, as I said, it loses. So the Electoral College imposes that kind of discipline on us. There's no indication in the Constitutional Convention that that was the intention, but certainly that has been one of the results. Another result, which, again, not, not necessarily the view of the Constitutional Convention, but which has been a benefit, is that it discourages fraud. <laughs> now, when you have elections, you will have voter fraud. That's like saying, when you have weather, it will rain. And it simply happens. And it's always happened because voter fraud is about as American as apple pie. And it has happened in all of our elections. But the Electoral College does discourage fraud in this sense. If you have Wyoming, for instance, casting only three electoral votes, there's not really a whole lot of sense into staging massive voter fraud in Wyoming, because you're not going to get much of a benefit from it. So it means that if you are going to have voter fraud, it's going to be limited to certain areas. It's going to discourage it. Now, if, on the other hand, you had a national popular vote, and it was a direct election, you could have incidences, staged incidences, of voter fraud in very remote places, and it would be almost impossible to track down all the incidents of it. We would be in litigation over the results of an election like that for years after the election took place. So again, while the Electoral College isn't necessarily designed to discourage voter fraud, it does have that beneficial effect. Not uniform, not across the boards, but certainly much more so than if we didn't have the Electoral College at all. Another benefit of the Electoral College is that it forces the appeal of presidential candidates to places beyond just high population concentrations. In a national popular vote, there would be no incentive for presidential candidates to do serious campaigning anywhere outside of California and New York because that's where the popular concentration of votes are. Now, the Electoral College is not perfect in that respect. Instead of forcing candidates to just concentrate on two states, it makes them campaign in 10 or 12. But 10 or 12 is still an improvement over just two. Do we want a system in which a handful of 
urban cluster areas become the tail that wags the national dog? I'm not really convinced we do. Let me give you an example on the state level. The state of Illinois in the 2016 election, Illinois has 100 counties. 98 of those counties voted for one candidate. Two of those counties voted for the other candidate. I won't identify which candidate. But that candidate with the two counties got all of the electoral votes for Illinois. In a case like that, we can easily imagine how presidential candidates not working under the burden of the Electoral College would in fact simply give up campaigning anywhere else except that handful of urban areas because that's where the popular vote would be concentrated. So there's a forcing, forcing of an appeal of the candidates beyond just those urban areas. Again, not perfect, but still, it is a benefit. Another benefit of the Electoral College in terms of a positive contribution is its affirmation of something which is really at the root of American constitutionalism, and that is federalism. We are a federal republic. We are a union of states. And sometimes it does us good to remind ourselves of that because that federalism works at so many different levels that it can be said to be right in the marrow of our political bones. If we were to jettison federalism, we would need to get rid not just of the Electoral College, we would need to get rid of almost everything in the Constitution, or perhaps the Constitution itself. The same logic which objects to the Electoral College would have us get rid of the United States Senate, because that too is not elected in quite the popular way we might want, because each state gets just two senators apiece. It would also jeopardize elections to the House of Representatives. Why? Because the states, the states draw district boundaries. They're not drawn nationally. They're drawn by the states. If we want to jettison federalism, if we want to jettison the Electoral College, uh, then we're going to have to jettison that too. In fact, if what we're concentrating on is the popular aspect of electing executives, why not just get rid of the elections themselves and have referenda every year, or every six months, or every time there's a major controversy, or every time there's a scandal? Why not referenda at every point? Wouldn't that be a popular way of determining who should be the executive, either on the national or on the state level? And the Electoral College says, no, I don't think so, let's do it every four years. What do we get from that? we get some balance, we get some stability. Then just in historical terms, what did the Electoral College give us? There have been five elections in which the popular vote did not, in fact, tally with the electoral vote. Now of those five elections, I should mention, we got as president John Quincy Adams, this is in 1824, we got Quincy Adams rather than Andrew Jackson, a man who was, after all, guilty of murder in a duel, and who later gives us the Trail of Tears. We got Jackson anyway four years after that, but at least we held him off for four years. And we got John Quincy Adams, one of our more morally decent presidents. We got Abraham Lincoln in 1860. I don't need, I think, to explain that. We got Benjamin Harrison in 1888, turning back Grover Cleveland, a man who paved the way for Jim Crow and segregation in the South. I think that if those are the results of contested elections coming out of the Electoral College, of an imbalance between the popular vote and the electoral vote, we haven't really done all that badly with the Electoral College. And as I said, fundamentally, the Electoral College embodies a fundamental instinct of the founders. Slow down. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to Professor Amar for the third question. Uh, what might be the consequences of reforming or abolishing the Electoral College? They're going to be unintended consequences, and that's a reason to be cautious. Um, and I say that as someone who believes uh, basically in one person, one vote. Uh, but most of the consequences that were uh, alluded to, I'm very skeptical of. Less legitimacy, more third parties, um, 
uh, the fraud issue and the like. Um, uh, just a, um, a, a referendum uh, style um, uh, idea, the abolition of the Senate referenda on everything, uh, dogs and cats living together, um, uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, just um, uh, um, uh, plagues and, and locusts. No, no, no. Look. 85% of the arguments that you hear in favor of the Electoral College are bogus. And many of the ones you just heard, which are the hoary ones, the, that's H-O-A-R-Y um, uh, ones, the, the old fashioned ones, just can't be true because states pick governors all the time and they don't do it with an Electoral College. So the argument for the Electoral College does have to have, have to something to do with slavery. I mean, with, with federalism. Um, why presidents might be different from governors. So let me just go through and tell you what are unlikely to be adverse um, consequences. Okay, because if most of the if arguments that he made were right, states are stupid and they're not stupid. Oh. If only two districts are blue and 98 are red in Illinois, that's so bad. Oh, so then we shouldn't pick our governors of Illinois, one person, one vote statewide. Oh, because, oh, those bad Democrats, they're just going to appeal to all those black voters in Chicago. That's the logic of that, and I hate that logic. I'll be straight with you. Okay, that's a bad logic that, because, oh, in California, they're only going to, um, uh, within the governorship of California. They're only going to campaign in LA and, and, and the Bay Area because that's where the people are, not Shasta County. That has not stopped California from doing one person, one vote, or Texas, or Pennsylvania, or all the others. In fact, actually, you're going to get two parties with direct election because of Duverger's law, which is the most fundamental law that every political scientist is taught. In a two-party system, you're naturally, um, in, assuming in a winner-take-all system, you're, when there's one seat up for grabs, you're going to get two parties in long-term equilibrium. Um, and, and once you have it, it's going to be very difficult to disrupt. Um, so um, in fact, the Electoral College gives us a multi-party system, third-party spoilers, Ross Perot, uh, George, um, Wallace, um, uh, Ralph Nader, and so on, because someone who actually has regional appeal might be a spoiler, even if nationally they're implausible. Duverger's law says that when you have one seat up for grabs, whether it's a governorship or presidency or a Senate position with any given congressional district, one seat, it's a musical chairs game, both of the parties are going to try to get the middle, uh, appeal to the middle. So, Electoral college doesn't give us actually extra legitimacy. States do this all the time, and they don't, in general, have a, a problem um, with governorships. They don't have multiple parties. You have far more third party candidates, infinitely more, with the electoral college than you do actually at the state level. Um, there's nothing wrong um, with. I'm treating every vote equally, whether it's in the city or a suburb or an urban area. So all this old old Kansas only spend time uh, in, in big cities. So I, I, those points are bad. Um, they prove too much as a matter of logic. They prove that every state is stupid. And every state is not stupid. States, uh, um, Picking people is different than voting for laws, so I'm not arguing for the referendization of everything. The Senate is very different for reasons that I explain. I have a little essay, the top 10 arguments for the Electoral College and why they're uh, basically wrong. It's called the Senate Anxiety. I, I can't go through um, all of it, but uh, it's at, at page uh, 349 of the Constitution Today, available at fine bookstores everywhere, and Amazon. So, so um, this, um, the, 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 um, the Senate has a different logic. You're, there's not one. Um, the Senate is 100 different races, or in any given year, 33 or 34 different races with 66 or, or 68 different um, um, people running. You can't add the votes up together. It, it's just a completely different thing than when one guy is running against another guy, and one guy gets more votes, and the other guy wins. And I wouldn't actually call 1824 
Um, really, there, there really isn't enough popular voting and, and no one has a majority. Um, and that's also true even for 1860. So I wouldn't say John Quincy Adams or even Abraham Lincoln. We don't know quite who would want, you know, um, just straight up um, um, plurality rule. You know, if you have single transferable voting and other things, but we don't, that's not how states do it. They, they basically do it plurality rule. Lincoln had a plurality. He got more than any other person by far just in the popular vote. So, um, I, so I don't know if you can say that's just because of the electoral college he wins. Um, I was trying to be nice when I said, well, yeah, it gives us Lincoln. But vis-a-vis -vis the popular vote, not so clear. In 1824, actually, a lot of states aren't picking people by popular vote, so, so you can't really do that tally very well. Here are the best arguments, because they're going to be, the best argument is there are two. Because you need an argument that explains why you want to keep the way you, what you do for governors and also keep what you do for the presidency. That, that has to be the right shape of the argument and all the other arguments, 85% of them, are bogus because if they were right, states are stupid and states are not stupid. The third party argument, the legitimacy argument, the, the only campaign in a few places argument, the fraud argument, all of those are arguments against picking governors. You see one person, one vote. Here are the two arguments for the, 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 um, the electoral college. One is just inertia. It's the system we have, and any time some pointy-headed academic says, oh, I've got a better idea, and it's going to work out just fine, oh, well, maybe not. You see, because there are unintended, this is just a traditional social uh, conservative argument. If it's not really broke, do we need to mess with it? And I think that's a, actually a very strong argument, in fact. Um, but it explains, um, but, but these other arguments, it would say states should actually move away from the, the way they pick governors, and they should not. Okay, second argument. Something about federalism, something about how presidents are different from governors in certain you know, fundamental ways because you think that the, uh, the United States is fundamentally federal all the way down and that's not true within a state um, because um, it, you have to explain why presidents are different from governors. Um, and, and, and I think it's going to turn out to be some version of inertia and federalism. Um, but in fact, I'm, I want to be the first to admit that the consequences of reforming or abolishing the electoral college can't fully be known. If you win one, you tend to win the other, so you can say it's not that big a deal. Um, you know, if we, if we change, but you change, the, the, you do change the game. People are going to try to run up the votes in their base, and that's not true today. There are going to be um, consequences if you change the rules. And that's a reason to be careful, my fellow citizens. And I say that as someone who net-net basically might be willing to take the chance because I believe in one person, one vote, which is a strong argument for reform. One person, one vote. That's how we pick senators. That's how we pick governors. That's how we pick representatives in single member districts. And that deep equality argument would be the argument. But you're going to need a national system to monitor elections in all sorts of places. You're going to need uniform voting standards and, and all the rest. Oh, it's going to require a significant apparatus. And I agree with my friend that those are all real um, uh, reasons to just stick with what we got. OK, uh, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to call a bit of an audible here. Uh, our fourth question uh, was, should the Electoral College be reformed or even abolished? Why or why not? I think we're probably already yeah. getting a sense of where we're yeah. going on this. But what I'd ask is, uh, Professor Amar, if you could, in just a, a few minutes, I know you have an interesting and unique proposal for reforming rather than abolishing the Electoral College. Perhaps you could say a few words about that. And then, Professor Gelsa, I'll give you an opportunity to respond to the question about uh, consequences and uh, Professor Amar's Professor Gelzo is one of the world's leading experts on Lincoln, and it's an honor to, to be with him here. Um, here's something really interesting. Um, we change how we pick senators. The Constitution says state legislatures pick senators, and we have direct election. And one question is, why would senators have ever voted to make that change? Because they're voting to change the rules that got them elected in the first place. And the rules that got them elected in the first place have to be the good rules, right? That's what every senator would think. And the answer, in part, 
is by the time the 17th Amendment was proposed, many senators were already, in effect, through a kind of improvisation, series of improvisations, being elected more directly than the framers imagined. And the first step toward this, and this is why I'm tipping my hat and bowing to Professor Gelso, is actually something that he's quite an expert on, is the Lincoln-Douglas debates. You see, because the smallest little change, the parties told the voters before the state legislative election whom they were going to nominate for U.S. Senate if they were, to, or whom they were picked, excuse me, for U.S. Senate if their party controlled the state legislature. That turns the state legislative race into a kind of referendum of sorts, direct election of sorts. It, it's not perfect at all. If you, if you want Stephen Douglas to go back to D.C., vote Democrat. If you want Abe Lincoln, vote Republican for state legislative election. Now, it doesn't work perfectly. Actually, more people vote Republican than Democrat, but there's malapportionment, there's gerrymandering, not all seats are up for grabs, there are rounding errors, all sorts of things. But it's the beginning of a democratization of, actually, Senate elections. And then other states do other things. Here's the Oregon plan. On the ballot, there, um, you vote for um, um, House member and governor and state legislator, and you vote for non-bindingly whom you prefer for U.S. Senate. It's just a beauty contest, but you're now the state legislature. Are you going to disregard you know, the people's choice? And then they modify it several other ways. On the ballot, you're running for state legislature. Your name appears, your party appears, and also whether you've pledged or not pledged to support the beauty contest winner and so on. Studying that, I thought, hmm, is it possible to imagine improvisations within the existing system without amending the Constitution that might actually move toward um, a, a more uh, national popular vote system without a constitutional amendment? And it turns out there are a couple of ways, by analogy to the Lincoln-Douglas debates and the Oregon plan and the like. One is a scheme called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. It's a little screwy. Um, I have concerns about it, and I invented it. <laughs> um, and you can read all about it. Um, it's a, I posted this thing on a website on the one-year anniversary of Bush versus Gore because I thought I was sitting in my bathtub one day, you know, Archimedes like, and 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 and, and you know, because when you're soaking in water, your your, your brain is going to oh. Actually, here's a cool thing that you could do. So I just posted, like, thinking no one would pay any attention. And the next thing I know, people are starting to pay attention. And I think, oh, I'm not sure I wanted anyone to pay attention. I just thought this was a kind of interesting thought experiment. Could you approximate direct election? Here's how it works. State legislatures can choose by statute to, to give uh, the, uh, to their electoral votes, not to the person who wins more votes in the state, but to the person who wins more votes nationally. And if we do that, oh, we're going to have all sorts of complications about how we decide who wins more votes nationally, because we're trying to add votes across these. This is good. There's going to be a lot of problems with this. Um, and, 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 and I am more aware of them probably than, than most, because uh, there's a second way. Um, but that's called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. If, if California says we're going to give our votes to the person who wins the national vote, and so does New York and a whole bunch of other states, big or small, and they add up to 270 electoral votes, oh, well then if you win the national popular vote, you win those 270 electoral votes, you win in the electoral college, and that's not a constitutional amendment. But it has some real problems, and I'm not sure actually you know, that you should just sign up for it tomorrow. I'm trying to be as honest as I can, because I share some of my friends' concerns. There's yet another way of achieving direct national election of the presidency that's much easier um, to do than the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Um, it involves a handshake deal between presidential candidates. I'm not going to go into great detail, um, but you can read about it if you're interested. Um, uh, and, um, and it's in the spirit of actually the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which popularized um, state, um, excuse me, U.S. Senate elections in ways that were at some odds with the original founding system. And that's why I would be very interested to hear Professor Gelzo tell us about his ideas about the Lincoln-Douglas debates in particular, which are a move toward this popularization and, and to some extent that he warns against. And he has some reasons for warning against. 
curious if that was what was in view of the Lincoln Douglas debates, why Lincoln never raised that as an issue himself. In fact, when Stephen A. Douglas is elected by the Illinois legislature in January of 1859, Douglas's proclamation was, let the voice of the people rule. Well, he thought it had, and so it seemed, too. In fact, we did not know for a very long time exactly what the voting patterns of Illinois in 1858 uh, really looked like. I think it might be more instructive to move on to considering the National Popular Vote Initiative, which effectively asks that electoral votes in the states be cast proportionately, split proportionately, depending on how the popular vote in a particular state has gone. And this is one way, it's supposed, of solving problems. The problem, of course, being disenfranchisement. Because practically speaking, what does the Electoral College do? Well, the complaint that is often made, made is that it violates one person, one vote. It disenfranchises voters effectively. Uh, the Illinois example comes back once again. Why should two counties in Illinois be the tail that wags the dog for the other 98? Don't the people in the other 98 count as well? Or are they something less than citizens? Well, we don't really want to say that. So how do we get around the idea of effectively disenfranchising 98 out of 100 counties in one state? Or take any state that way. Uh, how do we get around that particular problem? Well, the National Popular Vote Initiative it proposes one way of doing it, but I'm not sure that it would. Uh, go with me into the weeds for a moment. Let's, let's do some numbers. Um, the 2016 election. If we take the state of Texas, for instance, and we cast the votes and we determined the electoral votes on the basis of the proportion of popular voting in Texas. On that basis, Mrs. Clinton, would have won the votes of exactly 15.5664 Texas electors. And Mr. Trump would have won 18.8028 Texas electors. Uh, the, the hitch, of course, is in those decimal points. Because constitutionally speaking, without rewriting the Constitution or amending the Constitution, it is electors, not proportions of electors, not decimal points, that cast electoral votes. So that Mrs. Clinton would either have to receive 15 or 16 of those electoral votes. If that were the case, then 0.4 I'm sorry, 0.5664 Texas voters would have poofed into non-existence. And in Texas, since each of the state's electoral votes speaks for 236,000 voters, that means that over 100,000 pro-Clinton Texans would be as disenfranchised under the national popular vote system as under the current electoral college. Or if Texas is considered to be too odd an example, let's try Wisconsin. Wisconsin casts 10 electoral votes. Each of those electoral votes represents 297,000 voters in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, that means that Mrs. Clinton, based on the 2016 election returns, would have earned 4.722 votes. Should we round that up to five electoral votes? If we do, we turn 412,000 non-Clinton voters into pro-Clinton voters. How then have we solved the problem of one man, one vote? How have we solved the problem of disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement better than the Electoral College? I think that Every time we look at ways to deal with the Electoral College, we keep finding such pits of difficulty that it takes us back to the Electoral College, sometimes with a sigh of relief. Compare, for instance, the way that we, uh, compare the, how we do the Electoral College with another federal republic, which is the Federal Republic of Germany. 
Voting in Germany is a maddeningly complex system in which, for an election, you cast really two votes, one for a dominant party, one for uh, individual candidates. One set of votes will elect the formal head of state, but the party votes end up electing who's going to be the effective head of state, which of course in this case today is Mrs. Merkel. Or let's take the British system, since that's on everybody's mind these days. Uh, in the British system, nobody votes for the head of state. You, know, you vote for a party, and then the party decides, based on its leadership, who the prime minister is going to be. Nobody ever casts a vote in Britain for a prime minister. Do we say that in Britain and in Germany we have a better system than the Electoral College in the Constitution? I really don't think so. Is the Electoral College perfect? No. Is the American Constitution perfect? No. Can we make it worse? Unfortunately, yes. I think we have more to worry about in our electoral system than just the Electoral College today. I don't think that's the biggest problem we deal with. We deal on local levels with problems about voting, about qualifications, about fraud. In Detroit, in the 2016 election, voting machines registered more votes than there were registered voters in one-third of the city's precincts. How did that happen? Nationally, we cast votes by mechanisms that are a mishmash of voting systems, often without auditable paper ballots, using touch screens and computer databases and other shiny new toys that in fact have turned out in recent years to create, it, create an even greater froth of uncertainty, litigation, and, and, and contest over the results of our elections. I think we have a lot more to worry about on those terms. I think there's a lot more energy we can put into reforming the way we actually vote than in tinkering with the Electoral College. I think the energy that we put into thinking about the Constitution is good, but let us be careful that sometimes we do not lay a 10-foot wide plank over a chasm 10 feet wide. It might look good, but when we put weight on it, it collapses. That is really bogus. All right, thank you. So I think at uh, this point we can open things up for uh, Q&A. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Watts here is uh, setting up the microphone, so if, you'd, uh, if you have a question, please feel free to... You, you'll need to come to the microphone because the, uh, if, we turn, if we take the microphone off the stand or turn it towards the speaker, there might be a bit of feedback, so it needs to be here and facing this way. But uh, feel, free, feel free to come up if you, if you have questions or comments on the address to the... Um, And if I could ask if you, when you receive a question, if you could please repeat it so that it gets recorded as well. That would be great. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tank Cleveland. Staying back with you. Um, my question is mostly for Professor Amar. This was not your whole argument, but occasionally your argument came back to the principle of one person, one vote. Indeed. But you did not uh, explain why this was such an important principle to you. And in some respects, it seems obvious, perhaps, that this is a worthwhile principle. But there are certainly all sorts of aspects in American life where you know, that principle does not hold, and it's reasonable that it does not hold. So I, I suppose I, I wanted you just to spell out more clearly why that's such a worthwhile principle. Great. Why, the question is, why one person, one vote? Now, just first, a point of clarification, nothing in the national interstate um, popular, uh, national popular vote interstate compact has anything to do with proportions. There are, that, those are other proposals that are out there. I oppose all of those. So, so national popular vote does not split things up, doesn't do anything like that. It just says, here's what we do today. 
whoever gets more vote in more votes in Pennsylvania, one person, one vote gets Pennsylvania's electors. That whoever gets more votes, that person's electoral slate it, are the electors for Pennsylvania. All the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact does is say whoever gets more votes nationally, one person, one vote, that's the candidate who um, gets to pick um, the electoral slate for Pennsylvania. There's nothing that divides anything up. It's not a system of dividing up Texas's electoral vote or Pennsylvania's um, by um, uh, 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 apportioning them compared to the, the popular vote totals. Um, and if you did apportion it, you would skew the electoral college massively. Right now, it's, it, it perhaps slightly tilts toward the Republican Party, but maybe not. Um, uh, before The day before the Bush-Gore election, many people thought Al Gore might win the Electoral College while losing the popular vote. That was a plausible scenario. But the reason right now, it does, and if you had had a different candidate, Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio, rather than Donald Trump, I'm not sure that the Electoral College inversion would have materialized. It had to do with Hispanics and where they were located, and Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush would not have run the same kind of um, uh, anti-Mexico uh, um, campaign that Trump did. Here's why today the Electoral College is not skewed, in general, not hugely skewed. The Democrats win, on average, more big states. And because of winner take all, they get a huge bonus. The Republicans win more states overall, especially states where no one lives, the big boxes in the middle, like Wyoming, which get a two, two senator per state bonus. Those two things offset. Democrats win on average seven to 10 big states, and winner take all gives them a big bonus. Republicans win more states overall, 30 out of 50, and they get two extra senators per state, and those bonuses cancel out in the main. But if you went to some proportion system, oh, it would be massively skewed to the Republican Party. It would be even worse if you did it by congressional districts, which some people in Pennsylvania has proposed, because you're bringing gerrymandering into the whole thing, and Democrats might win Pennsylvania statewide in a very big way, but actually not even get a majority of Pennsylvania's electors, because they're losing, actually, congressional districts. So, so your big philosophical question is why one person, one vote? Because it treats every voter equally, don't you see? Um, and that's why we use it to pick senators within Pennsylvania, governors within Pennsylvania, representatives for each you know, house district, to treat a vote equally, whether you live in a city or a suburb um, or um, a, a rural area. It, 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 there's a fundamental equality. Now, here's where my friend, Al, um, Professor Gelzo, is absolutely right. If that's your idea, you're going to have to really think a lot about the practical inequalities um, because in some places we've got um, a sleek voter technology and in other places we've got long lines. Um, there's not actually a perfect evenness, even today within states, which is a problem for state governorships, and it's going to be, there are going to be even more complexities trying to create a genuine evenness and equality across the nation. We're going to have to have uniform rules for who votes because I believe in federalism. And in fact, here's a federalism argument for a national popular vote. It will encourage states to let people vote. Because right now, a state disfranchises um, lots of people and it doesn't pay a price. Think about 1900. Some states let women vote, others don't. If you have direct election and your state lets women vote, let women vote, you've doubled your clout. This would have been a, a, an argument that would have encouraged states to enfranchise people. Today, states disenfranchise folks and they don't pay any penalty in a direct election system. If you disfranchise folks, there are fewer people from your state you know, voting and, and you're hurting your state. But we may have created too strong an engine. I'm actually encouraging states to compete in all sorts of ways. One state's going to say, here's how we're going to make it easy to vote. We're going to have same day, um, we're, we're going to have um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, election as a holiday. 
And another state says, oh, we're going to actually have the uh, ballots open, uh, the, the, um, uh, the precincts open for two weeks. Um, and another state says, um, um, we're going to let you do easy mail-in. And, and, and different ways of making it easy to vote. This is good in a way. This is federalism at its best. It's a certain kind of competition. Oh, but it's intention with the idea of perfect equality. Because it, um, so, so there are, are genuine real tensions. Who gets to vote? He says, actually, at the founding, he's right. There was great variation in who could vote. Um, some states let um, uh, unproperty people vote, others not. In a direct election world, Texas is going to say, hey, we want Texas to count a lot. We're going to let 17-year-olds vote. California's going to say, you know what? California's far more important than Texas. We're going to let 16-year-olds vote. Arkansas comes in and says, we're going to let dogs vote. Um, and you're going to need a lot of national oversight to actually, if you believe, as I do, in one person, one vote, because I teach constitutional law, and it's a bedrock principle of Reynolds versus Sims, one person, one vote is a very central principle. It's how we pick governors. It's how we pick senators within states. It's how we pick representatives. But you're right. That Quality idea, it's a radical one, has all sorts of implications, but the fundamental idea is that all voters are equal, whether they live in a city or a suburb, whether they're black or white, whether they live in a rural area, and I say whether they live in Texas or California, but that's going to be complicated because of federalism. I wish that, um, I wish that Professor Amar was consistent that way. But in fact, the United States Senate is the outstanding example of how one person, one vote does not operate. In fact, Reynolds versus Sims in 1964, which is, that's 1964, that's not 1787. 1964 is the one person, one vote decision. Uh, that did not touch, that deliberately left untouched the United States Senate. The United States Senate has two senators from each state, no matter how many people live in that state, no matter how large that state is. California gets two, Wyoming gets two, Wisconsin gets two, Pennsylvania gets two, doesn't matter. So much for one person, one vote. Now, does that mean that one person, one vote is not important? No, what, what it does mean is there's a significant difference. There's a qualitative difference between elections on the state level Elections for state legislatures, elections for state governors, and elections on the federal level. And it's all bound up in that word, federal. This is a federal union. And the dynamic at the federal level functions in a different way. And that is the way that was recognized as part of what federalism means in the federal constitution. Now, if we want to rewrite all of our voting, and we want to make everything as direct and popular as possible, let's get rid of federalism. In fact, let's jump the Constitution and rewrite it completely. Because who needs federalism then? What really is at stake here is whether federalism itself is an idea that we want to continue to embrace. Now, if we don't want that, the Electoral College becomes simply a footnote. It only becomes a question within the question. Let's ask ourselves, are we a federal union? Do we wish to be a federal union? Have we prospered as a federal union? Was a federal union the vision of the founders? It's the answers to those questions which should govern how we respond to the issue of the Electoral College, not the other way around. Let's go at the question the way that it ought to be gotten at. Not from behind, not through a back door, not in reverse. Let's ask ourselves frankly, do we want a federal system? If we don't, fine. Let's get rid of the federal executive, the federal judiciary, the federal legislature, because all of that embodies federalism. Federalism is baked into the American pie. We do everything by federalism in this country. We even do education on the basis of federalism. Yes, we have a United States Department of Education, but what do we have? We have individual state educational systems, higher educational systems. The higher educational system in Pennsylvania is different from the one in Connecticut. The one in Connecticut is different from the one in Wisconsin and so on and so forth like that. Why? We're talking about federalism. And there's federalism within that, even within the states. Because here in Pennsylvania we have school districts which are well not independent of each other. And the school districts in Pennsylvania are not beholden to school districts in other places. 
Now, federalism is in the nature of things. What we're really talking about here is the future of federalism itself. Do we want a federal union? Is that what we established in Philadelphia in 1787? Is that what we fought the Civil War over? I mean, these are the questions that we have to come back and answer ourselves today. Is this a federal union? That explains the differences, not some perverse allegiance at one level to one system of doing things and a completely different way of doing it in others. That's not perverse, that's federalism. Hi, Hi, I'm Declan. I'm a political science student. My question is uh, mostly for Dr. Gwelzo. You mentioned that a benefit of no, the... Gwelzo. Gwelzo. It's okay, I, I have trouble with it myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, you mentioned that an argument for keeping the Electoral College is that the college confers legitimacy even in close elections. And it is true that in a lot of close elections, a clear majority in the Electoral College lent legitimacy, basically, to the winner. But in 2000 and 2016, when the Electoral College contradicted the popular vote, wouldn't you say that that actually diminished the legitimacy of the president who was elected in those elections? No more than I would say it diminished the legitimacy of Abraham Lincoln. Now, we want to say that Abraham Lincoln was an illegitimate president. All right, well, yes, let's say that then. Let's be consistent. But that's what we would have to say. Well, Lincoln did get more votes than anyone else. So, and, and, and when we, for example, pick governors, most uh, states don't do majority rule, they right. do plurality rule. Um, so if you get more votes than anyone else. Now, it's true, we would never know what would have happened if we played by different rules. Um, but here's a variant of your, your point, which I think is also, in many, many, so I, I don't buy the legitimacy point at all. I, I buy what Professor Gelso just said in his most recent answer. Federalism is the best argument for the electoral cause plus inertia. The other arguments are not good arguments because they actually prove too much about governors and two counties within Illinois governing the rest of Illinois and all the rest. And oh, I don't want to go there, and you should not want to go there either. So those are. But here's a legitimacy argument against him. So I don't think the legitimacy argument is a good one. And there's a new book out by uh, Al Hirsch that makes this compellingly. There have been. In the uh, uh, there, uh, in, in the, especially in the modern era, there are lots of elections that are overwhelmingly clear in the national popular vote, but have been very, very uh, close within individual decisive states like like Florida. So, so it's true. You could imagine a situation where state votes are really clear, the electoral college is really clear, but the national popular vote is is um, uh, within a hair. In fact. More often the case, the national popular vote has been really clear that there are electoral college glitches. Now the reason I'm not relying on that very much, I just think the legitimacy argument proves too much because it would suggest that we're, we're doing wrong with governors. We don't know, honestly, what the vote count would have been um, had the candidates been playing by different rules. You change the rules, you change the game, that's a big political science point that I want you to, to know as a political science major. So we can't be sure each party would have tried to run up the votes in its base. So, so we don't know, but I don't think the Electoral College is about conferring legitimacy. Um, uh, and, and you are right that in today's world, People say, oh, George W. Bush, you know, he's illegitimate. Donald Trump is illegitimate. More people voted you know, against him. And I'm not one of those people, because I say he played by the rules and won by the rules. And if he had actually, if the rules had been different, they would have played a different game. And you know who says that all the time? Donald Trump says that all the time. And I don't agree with him on lots of stuff, but that's a fair point. Um, so, so the, um, the, uh, the, but if we had different rules, one person, one vote rules, oh, I think those would be very good rules. Those are the rules that we have within a state for governor. And the strongest argument for not doing that for the presidency 
is an argument in one word, federalism. Yes, that is an argument of some form. And the second is inertia. Hello, my name is Kenny. I'm a political science major. Um, Your name I'm, is? Kenny, sorry. Um, my question is for Dr. Galza. Um, can, can I ask for a proportionality between history majors and political science majors? <laughs> no, no? Oh, okay, all right. Um, my question is, um, you talked a lot about uh, Germany and you talked a lot about Britain's electoral system, but um, you didn't mention Australia or Ireland's electoral system in which they have multiple party systems and they function on like a ballot list in which you would name the top like, five, ten candidates in which you would choose. It allows for a lot more leniency to like, I don't know, someone who's pro-abortion but loves their guns, like more flexibility among people who have different opinions other than just red and blue. I, I just wanted to know your opinion on that. Well, let me, let me add to that and say there are a number of nations which do have do in fact have direct popular vote. I mean, there, there are nations which have for their head of state, you know, one, one person, one vote. Iran, for instance. Again, you don't, you don't necessarily, I mean, this is not like mathematics. You don't put a certain quantity of input and then you're guaranteed a certain output. It's not the way it works. Human beings don't work that way. Human systems don't work that way. So the variety has to suggest to us how cautious should we be in dealing with our own system. It's caution that I'm suggesting is a worthwhile rule to respect. Now, if you want to call that inertia, you want to call that prudence, mm -hmm. I'll take it under whatever name we want to sure. call it. But I think caution yeah. is, is, is something worth considering. Yeah. The, the world is divided in several ways. There are democracies and there are non-democracies. I think democracies are better. Within democracy, and, and there are many reasons why I think they, they're more respectful of human dignity, they bring in more information in the system. Marty Sen shows that they don't have famines uh, because the government actually reacts and avoids worst-case scenarios uh, because if it doesn't, it's out um, uh, on its ear. Whereas, for example, when India is controlled by um, uh, Brits, um, millions of people die because the Brits don't care because they're, they're, they're not elected. Um, now, among the democracies, here are your basic distinctions, and it's not clear which system is better. Some have written constitutions, some don't. And Britain is suffering right now because it doesn't have a written constitution. Um, some are two-party systems and some are multiple-party systems. Each has advantages. Ours is a deep, strong two-party system. Almost every um, uh, important official at almost every level, state and federal, for the last 150 years has been an R or a D. Very, very strong two-party system. Other states have cumulative voting, single transferable voting, proportional representation systems, the hair system in Ireland and all the rest. Each has advantages. When I was a young person, I said, oh, I like that proportional representation system. And I'm an old person, I say, actually, our system works pretty well for us and there'd be huge transition costs, call it caution, call it, call it prudence, call it inertia. Some systems, some democracies are strongly federal, ours is. Some are strongly centralized, see, France. Um, uh, um, um, some, so um, two parties versus multiple parties. Written constitutions versus um, not written constitutions. Um, uh, strongly federal um, versus um, uh, 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 strongly um, centralized. These are the real differences among, the, some are parliamentary, where the legislature picks the head of state and members of the executive branch sit in the legislature and some are strongly presidential. Every one of America's 50 states and the US Constitution are strongly presidential. A separate governor from the, uh, from the legislature, independently elected. I can't tell you that presidential are better. People like Juan Lins think otherwise. A great political scientist is parliamentary are better. I can't tell you that two party are better than multiple party. I can't tell you that written constitutions clearly dominate unwritten like Israel's and, and England's. Um, uh, 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 I, uh, so, um, and, and, um, but what I can tell you is I think democracy, uh, or I can't tell you that national uh, systems are worse than federal systems or vice versa. Um, I think 
you know, democracy is still too young, and we'll, those are 16 permutations right there, two to the fourth. Um, so uh, um, each has advantages and disadvantages. Hello, I'm Sadiq Bhakti, I'm a professor in the economics department. So I have a question uh, for Professor Amar, which has to do with sort of thinking about the veil of ignorance. So if I think about the 2000 and 2016 elections, I suspect, and I can't prove it, that part of the reason we have had this discussion about reforming electoral colleges because of who won and the identities of the parties. Do you think that's true? I don't, I don't believe that that's the primary reason why you would advocate for it, but do you believe that's part of the reason why we have this discussion about reforming the electoral college? The question is, do, are we having this election in part because of the 2016 race? It was a very polite question, but also maybe sour. Is there sour grapes involved or something like that? And I think the answer is yes, that's part of it. And, and it's not just 2016, but it's also 2000, and the same party benefiting both times, even though I'm not sure that that's actually you know, a deep structural feature. Here's what I can tell you, that I've, my ideas have been out there for a very long time, and I haven't really um, change them in the light of this election or that one, and um, whatever the rules are, if you win by the existing rules, you're the winner, and that's legitimate, you see, because you would have played the game different. This is a, uh, you know, if you're an economics professor, the question was from an economics professor, you understand the ex-ante perspective, and I'm adopting the ex-ante perspective, and, and if the rules have been different, people would have had different strategies and played the game differently, but yes, you're right. One of the reasons I think we are having this conversation today is we've had two inversions fairly recently, and uh, it's there's and both times they favored one party. Yeah, I think that's true. All right. Well, I think that uh, that concludes our session. Thank you very much.